afternoon, Keys to Fun, and welcome to our series review. Today we will be going over songs starting out with the song Marianne. And admittedly, this is going to be about a half hour long, probably not as long as um, you might like it to be. I'm going to cover eight songs in about a half hour, so they will be relatively brief. But don't forget, if you're part of our program, and you've been part of the program throughout the entire last series, you have now eight hours of videos covering each one of these songs in a whole hour's length. And so if we happen to go over something and you say, I feel like I could use a few more tips and tricks with this song, do not hesitate to go back into your inbox. I do have some students that in their inbox create one single folder where they can compile all of the videos together. Go back and take a look at some of these videos. Obviously, first and foremost, you can reach out to me and I'm more than happy to explain something a little bit further, maybe make something a little bit more clear for you. But the best review that I think that you can get if you have the time is to go back and re-watch some of the videos, particularly of the songs that you really enjoy playing so that you can perfect or maybe better perfect uh, your work through that song via some extra help that I may have given that week. So again, this is going to be a hopefully concise yet relatively brief review of the last eight songs. But if you have videos of all eight, feel free to go back and watch them. They're a great help in relearning some things that we may have forgotten over the course of time. Now we started out playing the song Marianne. And Marianne at first glance, may have appeared to be a relatively simple song. And, and for the most part, it's not the hardest song in the world. If you look at some of the other songs that you have received via our music program prior to Marianne or even since then, they're much longer, they're much more intricate. Marianne was about four lines long. It uh, dealt with basically all white keys. And if you were playing this using the features that you may have available to you uh, to their greatest degree, I'd imagine that song probably did not give you an incredibly large amount of difficulty. And that was the goal, that was the idea, was to allow you to get through a song playing potentially, if you have this option, one finger in your left hand, one finger in your right hand, and allowing it to sound really, really good. And some students, that's as far as they get. They're happy with that. They have this opportunity to use an instrument that has so much uh, technology built into it that they don't have to put forth an incredibly large amount of effort in either hand, which is fine. You paid for it, I'd like you to have the opportunity to use it. Some of the people that take lessons here have been taking lessons with me over 10 years and that's the way they're happy playing, which is absolutely fine. But I know there are some of you that are urged to go a little bit further. Maybe you practice that and it takes you maybe a day or so to really perfect and you say, gosh, I'm ready for something new. Do I have to wait until I receive a new song? Um, do I have to go out and find something on my own that I can work on? If I'm going to do that, now I don't have any instruction on that song, so am I practicing it right? Well, what you can do is you can take a song that you feel as if you have down pretty well and add additional elements to the song to make it more of a challenge for yourself. One of the things that I would first suggest doing is adding fingers into the left hand. Now your instrument may give you a whole, thing, a whole chord with one finger, but it doesn't mean that that chord is physically only comprised of one key. It just means when you play one key, the other keys are played on your behalf. Okay, and that's an important distinction. Now, a C chord inside the box that looks like that is actually comprised of more notes than just the C. You may just be playing the C, but the C chord is comprised of the C, the E, and the G in its fullest form. 
So something that you can do is you can add one of these other keys to the C. And if your instrument is set a specific way, this goes for clavinovas uh, as well as uh, Lowry's, you may be able to decide how many fingers you want to use. You can use one, you can use two, you can use three. And in some instances, adding the additional fingers does not make a difference in the sound on an electronic instrument, which some students may feel is counterintuitive. Well, if I only use one finger and then I decide to use three and it sounds the same, what's the advantage to that? Well, one advantage is obviously for people that don't have a button like that, a feature like that, every finger that they add makes a difference. So for someone playing on an acoustic piano, this is a big deal. But even for someone that isn't, if you're playing one finger and all of a sudden you add the other two and it sounds the same, that should tell you something. It should tell you you did it right. If you play three fingers and it sounds exactly the same as if you play one, if your instrument is set to do that, it means that you're practicing correctly. It also gives us the opportunity, something we go over in, in prior series, to know that there are chords out there that are more than just one finger chords. I mean, the C you can get with one finger, the F you can get with one finger, the G you can get with one finger. But there's only 12 chords that you can get with one finger because there's only 12 different notes. Now, how many chords are there? There's a heck of a lot more than 12. Which has got to lead you to believe that there are some chords you cannot get with just one finger, which is true. So you adding extra fingers into the left hand is really beneficial even if you're playing on an electronic instrument because it serves to make you comfortable using more than one finger. So inevitably, when you get to a chord that requires more than one finger, namely minor chords are the first ones that we tend to go over, you'll hopefully be prepared for it by already having attempted to play more than one finger, maybe with a chord like C. So these are the three notes of the C chord, the C, the E, and the G. And the interesting thing about chords is however many total notes there are in the chord, that amount of waves is the amount of times that chord can be played differently. Let me, let me try to rephrase that. That came out a little funny. If there are three notes in the chord, the chord can be played three ways. If there are four notes in the chord, the chord can be played four ways, so on and so forth. Now we call this way the C to the left. I'm putting these in order from the left-hand side of the keyboard to the right. The C to the left being the low tone. We call this as the C chord being in what we call root position. The lowest note is the name of the chord. Now let's say that I scrambled this up a little bit. Let's say I kept this E and I kept that G. But instead of playing the C to the left of those two notes, I were to play the C to the right of those two notes, meaning the higher C instead of the lower C. We call that the first inversion or first alternate version of the C chord. Now I can play it another way. The other way would be, we'll maintain the position of that G We'll keep this higher C, and then we'll take the E that we've been playing and play the E even higher than that. That would be the second inversion. Now these are all C chords. It's just a matter of the way that they're layered. I like to think of it oftentimes from the perspective of a singer. You have sopranos, you have altos, tenors, baritones. They can all sing different notes. Let's say you have your tenor sing a C, you have your alto sing an E, you have your soprano sing a G. Now let's say instead of your tenor singing the C, they sing the low G. And your tenors move down, or your, your altos move down to the C, and then your sopranos move down to the E. It's still a C chord but it's layered differently. It's going to sound different. So you can move in either direction. Now, if I were to bring this G over here, I'm back to root. I'm just an octave higher than I was. So these are the three ways that a C chord could be played, and every chord is broken up that same exact way. So this is an option for you. 
adding one of these notes or adding two of these notes, if you want to make it a complete chord, is a, an option that you can take advantage of if you so choose to. Now, you don't have to at all. You can play just the C. And if your instrument is set to play those other notes, well, that's, that's great. That's absolutely fine. You're not forced to do this, okay? If you're playing on a piano, though, every finger counts. Don't forget that. So the more fingers you add, particularly on an acoustic piano, the more notes you'll hear, okay? So you may be very apt to do that if you are practicing on a piano or have the inclination to ever play on one. One finger on a piano is going to sound like one key. Two are going to sound like two. Three are going to sound like three. We went over the fact that there are letters outside of boxes which would be indicated to be played uh, in the bass or the left hand, and letters inside of the boxes. Inside of the box is a chord. A letter outside of the box is a single key. Now, it could be a single key all the way to the left on a piano. Some people that have organs would play that on the bass pedals down on the floor. That's basically just a big keyboard because it's bass, it's the low tone. So another element that you could add into the song is you could add a bass tone and then a chord that follows it. And you see that option in Marianne as well. Something else that could be added in, if you used backgrounds, which I know many of you, you have, Marianne would be a Latin song. And if you turn on the Latin background, something that you probably recognized is the fact that on some instruments, it makes it appear as if your right hand is playing more than one key. Not on all instruments, but on some electronic instruments. I'll give you a great example here. If I put a Latin beat on and I play a chord, listen to the right hand. This is a single note. A double note. Now how did that happen? Well it happened on this instrument by adding a feature called duet. And duet adds an extra note into your right hand that plays on your behalf. You play one note in the right hand, they play another. Now does a piano have that? No. Are there electronic instruments out there that in spite of them being electronic, do they have that? The answer is no, not all of them. Okay? So I wanted to give you the opportunity to see how you could replicate that idea of playing two notes in your right hand at the same time to mimic what you just heard. What you do is you take your lead note, which is the note that you see, and to each one of those notes you're adding a second note. Every one of those keys has a different second note added to it. And that note, I suggested, was to be six keys lower than the one you're playing, starting your count from the one you're playing. So if I start on an E, I count six down, but I start with the E. So I go one, two, three, four, five, six, all white keys, mind you. And I get to the G. So what I do is I play them together and it creates a nice harmony. Now my next note is two keys higher. So what does my low note do? It moves up two keys higher, so it sounds like this. My next note is down four keys. So my low note is down. I'm maintaining four notes in the middle. So I have a note on either end, there are four white keys in the middle, and that spacing is maintained throughout. Now is that easy to do? It's not. It's why some buttons, some instruments have a duet button, so that you don't have to do that. But my goal for you again is to show you that many of the elements that we take advantage of can be done on your own. They can be done more traditionally. It will make it more challenging but for some of you, that's your goal. Some of you have said, I would like to take some of these songs and add 
another challenge to them. I feel like I have the song down. What can I do before I get a new song to make this song a little bit more challenging to me? Okay. And I chose Marianne because all in all, it's a relatively simple song. If I gave you a song that had a bunch of extra elements in it to begin with, it is likely that adding anything in addition to that was going to be uh, something that you are not going to be looking forward to doing or, or maybe just not feel like you were able to do. So my hope in Marianne was to give you a relatively simplified song as compared to what it could be in the hopes that you have the wherewithal or desire to try to add one of these other elements. Maybe not all of them, okay? This is, though, something that can be applied to virtually every song that we do. Little elements like this. And the rest of the series spoke about a few of these things in a little bit greater length. Our next song was the song Michael Row the Boat Ashore. Now, you received two copies of Michael Row the Boat Ashore. And if you were in our beginners series, our first 10 week course, Michael was one of the songs that you received. If you weren't in that series, I handed it to you or emailed it to you, whatever the case may be, this week, okay? Everybody else has said, go back and take a look at the one that you have, unless you don't have it, in which case I, I gave it to you again. Now, I gave you two copies of that song, okay? They were both in what we would call different keys. One was in the key of G, that would have been the original one. The new one that I gave you was in the key of C. Now there were things that these songs had in common. One big one was there were only six notes in each version. Six notes in one, six notes in the other, they're all next to each other. You have to make a decision as to which one of your fingers, because you only have five fingers, is going to play a second note. My suggestion is always one of the two on the end. Keep the ones in the middle stationary. Either your thumb goes down and plays an additional sixth note or your pinky goes up and plays an additional sixth note. That decision is yours. And whichever one of those decisions you make, use it for both renditions. That week we spoke about students that had tried to play multiple fingers in their left hand. They tried to do this. They, they took what we went over with Marianne, they tried it with Marianne, and now they're trying to do it with this one. Okay. The question came up that week was, well, which one of these inversions or root position, which one do I use? And the answer is, I mean, it really doesn't matter so much so that the music doesn't tell you, I, I, probably the best way to put it. This style of music does not say to put them in a certain order. More traditionally printed music would. It'd be harder to read because there'd be an additional set of five lines and four spaces, but the notes of the chord would be listed individually in the order, stacked like a totem pole, in the order that they were meant to be played in. But again, this music's not printed that way. So the, the final decision essentially is yours. And it may not even sound different the order that you put them in if your instrument is electronic and you're getting help with your chords. Yamahas do this, Lowry's do this, okay? So you may not even be getting a difference in the sound. A piano would give you a difference and sometimes that might lead you to choose one direction uh, as opposed to the other. But let's say that you're playing on an instrument, which many of you are, where it doesn't make a distinction. If you play it C, E, G, or play it E, G, C, or G, C, E, it all sounds the same. Now, which one do I choose? I'm not even getting a difference in the sound. The answer is, the order that you choose to play them in is really most dependent upon the chord you're coming from as compared to the chord you're going to. So let's say, for example, I'm playing a C chord and my next chord is a G chord. And I'm playing the C chord in root position, C, E, G. If my next chord is a G chord, now my G chord notes are G, B, D in any order. So G, B, D, B, D, G, D, G, B, all a G chord. Well, if I'm playing C, E, G for the C chord and I need to go to the G chord, I would likely keep my finger on the G probably be my thumb if I'm playing it in that order. And I would move it. And I'd say to myself, what are the other two notes in the G chord? Well, he just said that they're the B and the D. Well, the B is one key down from the C, the E is one key down from the, uh, the D rather is one key down from the E, and the G stays the same, I only move two fingers. If I went to any of the other um, 
inversions or root of the of the other inversion or root of the G chord, I would have had to laterally move my hand a little bit further. So this is saving me from needing to do that. Now let's say that you are playing this inversion, the G at the end, the C and the D, a C and the E rather. Again, I would keep this note. Probably played with my pinky now because it's the lowest key. The C moves down one to the B, the E moves down one to the D. So here I move the two low notes down one, here I move the two high notes down one. I'm not going to get a difference in sound potentially, but I think ease of play is going to come into, uh, into play there. So the inversion that you choose is entirely up to you, okay? But there are some advantages in the choice you make dependent upon, again, the chord you're coming from and the order that those notes are in and the chord you're going to. Now again, we mentioned the fact that one of these songs was in the key of G, the other one was in the key of C. Now, if you've been following our program, we speak often about keys and the notes within a scale. And if you're familiar enough with the scale of G, you know that there's at least one black key in the scale of G, because the only scale, major scale, that only has white keys is the C. But if you look at both copies of this song, neither one has black keys. So how are they not both in the key of C? How is one in the key of G? Well, how we determine the key, we can look at our chords. What's my last chord? G. What's my first chord? G. What's my first note? G. What's my last note? I believe that's even G in one of them. Well, that's the key of G. It's pretty indisputable. There's G. Well, what are the notes of the G scale? It's all of the white keys, with the exception of the F sharp. If I play the notes of G, all white keys so far, but not the F sharp. Okay. That copy does not have an F sharp in it because there are no Fs. The copy in the key of G does not play any Fs. If it had called for an F, it is likely that that would have been an F sharp. But it was never called to play, never called to be played. It just didn't get up to that note. When you have a song in a certain key, it's using most of the notes from the scale. But it may not use all of the notes of the scale. And in the case of this rendition of Michael, it did not use an F, therefore it did not use an F sharp. It doesn't mean that it wasn't in the key of G, it just means that the F sharp was not utilized. The other one in the key of C is all white keys, and it's all white keys all the way through. Even if I use all of the notes of the scale, I'd still likely only be playing white keys because again, it's in the key of C. My suggestion that week was to play both renditions. Start with the old one, which was in the key of, I'm sorry, start with the new one, which is in the key of C, and then go to the, the, uh, the older one, which is in the key of G, well, older one for some of you. And something that uh, many students noticed that week is that they sound the same. I mean, they, they sound, one sounds higher than the other, but they both sound like Michael Rutherford Shore. I could start here. I could start here. I could start here. Start here. They all sound like Michael. Why? I started on different keys every time. What's well, a really interesting thing about the way our brains work? Because when we recognize a song, it's not that we necessarily recognize the song as this is a G, this is a B, this is a D, this is an A. We recognize the pattern that the notes create, the distance in pitch between the notes. And as long as the distance is the same, our ear will recognize that song no matter where we start. It's really interesting the way that our brains function. So most of us don't hear a note and say, that's a G. Most of us hear a tone, we reflect on the fact of what it sounds like, and then the next note is going to be a certain amount of distance higher or lower. And we're always computing the distance or the difference between those two notes. And after a while, we notice a recognizable pattern. It's the same way we recognize a lot of things. Someone's face, 
we recognize them as a whole, but there are elements about them that make them who they are. Their ears are a certain size, they're set apart a certain way, their eyes are a certain color or a certain shape, their cheekbones are a certain height, their chin has a certain cleft to it, their mouth is shaped a certain way. If you change enough of those small elements, the person begins not to look like the person that you recognize. I often speak about people that, uh, you know, in Hollywood that will, uh, you know, maybe indulge in a little bit more plastic surgery than, uh, than they may have needed. And all of a sudden you look at them and you say, my goodness, that doesn't even look like so-and-so. They've changed too much about the pattern that you recognize to the point where you don't recognize them any longer. And the same goes with music. If you start to change that pattern up too much, then all of a sudden the song is not going to sound like the song that you expected to hear. After Michael, our next song was The Little Brown Jug. Little Brown Jug, we spoke about that song being in the key of C. The fact that all of the white keys, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, are in the key of C, uh, in the scale of C rather, and this song deals with all of those. We spoke about how important the last measure of a song is when your first measure has pickup notes. We speak a lot about pickup notes and notes at the beginning of a song that are not a full measure and how if you're using an introduction that can be a little bit scary because you have to fit these notes either at the tail end of the intro or let the intro go and then you jump in after that or you don't play an intro at all. But as important as that first measure is, so is the last one because they need to add up to the correct amount of total beats for the song itself. In other words, if the song counts to four and you have a one beat pickup note at the beginning of the song, your last measure needs to have three beats. If you have a two beat pickup note or two notes worth two beats, your last measure has to, has, has, not has to have two beats. They need to add up to four. Reason being, if you want to go back and replay something, those two measures, the end and the pickup notes at the beginning, become one measure, which together add up to the correct amount of beats that that measure needs to get, just like all of the others. And we wanted to do that this week. Our goal was to play the song twice, and I had mentioned transposing. Now transposing digitally, artificially, which is what we're doing here, is different than what we did with Michael. Michael, we played two different renditions of the song, which in a sense transposed but it transposed naturally. This is an artificial or digital transpose where you play the same keys, but the notes sound like you're playing different keys. So what I did was I said, we're gonna go through the whole song, and then when I get to the end and I go back and restart, I'm going to make every key sound like the key immediately to the right of it, okay? I'm going to put my instrument from C to C sharp. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that every key that I'm playing is automatically now going to sound like it's one key up, now black and white included, okay? On the Yamahas, you go plus one. It means your key sounds like one key above it. Now, that is an important thing to keep in mind because we said that this song was in the key of C, which deals with all white keys. If all of a sudden, all of my white keys sounded like the key to the right of them, what key is most often to the right of a white key? And the answer is a black key, with the only exception of two keys, the E to the F, there's no black key in between those two, and the B and the C. Every other white key has a black key immediately to the right of it. So when you use that feature, again called transpose, and you're playing a song like Little Brown Jug, so you start like this, <laughs> transpose, I'm going to play the same keys, but listen to the notes. Now it sounded a little bit brighter. I played the same keys, but every one of those notes appeared to sound like I was playing a key to the right of it, which means every one of the white keys that I have to play in this song, with the only exception of two, would have turned into a black key. How much trickier would this song have been to play if that was the actual case? That's the beauty of being able to transpose with a button. So if you have that feature, count your blessings because it's 
you're, you're in a far better position than you would have been or, or we were before transposing existed. We spoke about a walking bass pattern that week. How the left hand notes went from G to C, single notes, low notes. They were just letters printed like this, G down to C. Very common for a big band standard style song. And I had said, you can actually make those chords if you'd like. You can play a G as a G chord, you can play an F as an F chord. Then you get to the E. I cannot play the E as an E chord in this song because it's in the key of C. And one of the notes in the chord E is not in the scale of C, the G sharp. It would be E, G sharp, B would be the notes of the E major chord. I would need to make it a minor, so I would need to play E, G, B. How about the D? Same thing. A D chord is D, F sharp, A. F sharp does not fit in the key of C. It's going to sound funny if I try to play that note. It's like trying to put a, a round peg in a square hole or a square peg in a round hole. Okay, you can try, but it's not going to fit very well. What you do is you make it a D minor. D, F, A. You play those three notes, they're going to sound much better. So if I go from G down to C, that had an E minor and a D minor. Let me do it with the E major, D major. I think you'll notice that it sounds a little funny. sounded much better the first time because the first time I utilized all notes in the scale of C, which is exactly what key Little Brown Jug is in. After Little Brown Jug, we played the caissons. The caissons go rolling along. One of the issues with caissons was students inadvertently playing in something we called cut time. Cut time essentially meant that you were taking all of the values of the notes and you were cutting them in half. Now there's a benefit to cut time. The benefit to cut time is that you don't have to rewrite the music. You can play it the same way a second time through and it's going to sound a little bit faster, actually twice as fast as it did the first time through. If you wanted to do it that way, that was the way I suggested this week was to play it through once the way that it was and then play it through again in cut time. Problem is some people inadvertently put themselves in cut time to begin with. So how do we make sure that doesn't happen? Well, the first step would be, in my opinion, you can always take a look at lights because some of you have lights that count around and you don't want to go any faster than those lights if you haven't got a quarter note. But some people don't have the lights. Best bet is to figure out how long it should take you to play that song. And there's a mathematical calculation that allows you to do that with fair certainty. You take the amount of measures there are. I like to use very even numbers because I'm not very good at math. Let's say there are 20 measures. Each one of those measures in one way, shape, or form has four beats in it if the song counts four, four. So you got 20 measures, each of which counts to four. You take 20 and multiply it by four. 20, 40, 60, 80, you get 80. That means there's 80 total beats in the song. Now, if I put my instrument at a rate of 80 beats per minute, how long should it take me to play that song? Play the right way? The answer is one minute, not 50 seconds, not 47 seconds, not a minute and eight seconds, not a minute and 15 seconds, one minute exactly. So if I play through this song and it takes me 30 seconds, I'm in cut time, which is fine if that's your goal. Many students told me that they enjoyed this song in cut time better then they enjoyed it in what we would call common time. Cut time sounds like this. Common time, normal time, sounds like this. Some people say that sounds a little bit slow, which is fine. If you want to play in cut time, that's no big deal. I just want you to know that you are. Now the benefit to us in talking about cut time is it makes the music easier to read. 
rather than having to write very, very small valued notes, we're leaving you with notes you're, you're comfortable seeing. Quarter notes, half notes, whole notes, dotted half notes. And we're just saying, play them for half as long, if that's a desire of yours. So you're taking what you see, you're not playing what you see, you're changing the rate of the note, how long you hold it down for, by cutting in half. That week we spoke about um, the possibility of some people wanting to use the bass pedals again on uh, for those bass notes. And if you're going to do that for people that have organs, particularly late model Lowry's, make sure that you're only using your MCS for your left hand if you'd like to try to play the bass, because the easy button is going to play the bass for you. The MCS won't, but it will still help you with the chord. So you can go ahead and try that. And you can still get some assistance with the left hand, but the bass can be something that you can practice on, on your own. After caissons, we had down by the riverside. Down by the, the riverside, you got two different copies of the same song. One was in the key of F, the other one was in the key of C. That week we spoke about something called 8VA. 8VA very much related to cut time. And you may say to yourself, what is the comparison between cut time and 8VA? And the answer is they both tell you to play the music differently than it's printed. Cut time told you to play the notes faster than they were printed. You hold them down for half as long. So if it's a one beat note, you hold it down for half a beat. If it's a two beat note, you hold it down for one. It looks like a two, you change it to one. 8VA speaks about playing an octave higher, in this case an octave higher than where the notes are printed. Now again, this is great because someone doesn't have to write the music uh, over if they want the song to be a little bit higher, maybe in a repeat or something along those lines. And that's very commonly done on an instrument like a piano. You know, one of the things with a piano, I don't want to say it's a detriment of the piano, it's just fact of the matter, is that an acoustic piano sounds like a piano and that's it. There's no button on an acoustic piano that can make it sound like a violin or a trumpet or an organ or a flute or a guitar, sounds like it sounds. So what that player might do is they may move their hand up to a higher octave to get a difference in the sound. Okay, but how about for you, just as a player, for you, one of the great things about your instruments is that you're not limited to only sounding one way. So is there a benefit for me to play at an octave higher? And the answer is, well, yeah, there is. Of all of the instrument sounds you have on your instrument, you certainly don't have everything. I mean, you got a lot more than we had when we first started. A lot of electronic instruments had five, six sounds on them originally. And let's say you are looking to hear the sound of a trumpet. You want to play What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong, but you have a trombone. By moving up an octave, that trombone is going to sound a little bit more like a trumpet. The reason that there are so many brass instruments and reed instruments is that they all cover different pitch ranges. Trumpet can only go down so low until it gets to the area where a trombone might play and vice versa. So if you're using the trombone, you end up in a range where a trombone player actually could not play and therefore the, the listener's ear says, oh, that must be a trumpet, even unknowingly. So you're given access to notes or sounds you didn't even realize you may have had, or at least a way to, to, to mask them or to imitate them. Another great thing about 8VA is it moves your hands apart from one another. I love that one as a teacher. Moving your hands apart from one another, isolating them, makes them more independent, which is what we're always looking for. We saw, uh, spoke about something called syncopation that week. There have been whole um, reports written about this idea of this thing called syncopation in music. Let me just boil it down for you very easily. Syncopation, an example in, in uh, Riverside would have been if you had a rest at the first beat of a measure, but you had a chord above it. So you play a chord, you play nothing in your right hand, and your right hand follows once the rest is done. Another example might be if you have tied notes and you have a chord above the end of the tied note. It's another example. Syncopation. Syncopation is basically playing a note where you don't expect to, or not playing one where you do and it can wreak havoc with your timing. Both of these songs, both of these renditions do play around with syncopation a little bit. Now we did this as a gospel song. Ideally, if you have gospel, you did that. Um, you may not have used a gospel beat, you may not have used a beat at all, but gospel would be the ideal one for Down by the Riverside. 
Each one of these copies appears to be a different length as compared to the other one. The, the one that um, is in the key of F is six lines on the first page and six lines on the second. The one that's in the key of C is only five lines, or four lines rather, on the first page, and I think five lines on the second. So we're missing some, some, some notes here. Where are they? The answer is they're, they're not missing because that one has you go back and replay something that, uh, that you already played. The benefit to that is they can print the music larger. What you'll notice about the six uh, line uh, rendition on both pages is printed much smaller. And I think you'll agree the smaller that the music is printed, the harder it is to read. So they expanded the size and kept it from being three pages by having you go back and replay something over. That was the halfway point of the series. The next song was a song called The Village Tavern Polka. Village Tavern Polka, we went over something called a celerando. And a celerando was an increase in the tempo in a song. What I was looking to have you do was increase by 10. I didn't care where you started, as long as in the different parts of the song you increased by 10. So if you started at 80, you went to 90, then you went to 100. If you started at 100, you went to 110, you went to 120, and so on and so forth. Now one of the reasons we did this is because the Village Tavern Polka, like many polkas, has that feel of uh, a rush movement to it. Many times bands that play polkas do increase their pace. And that's common with a lot of danceable songs. I, I hear this, uh, someone uh, mentioned the song Zorba the Greek, another song that starts out slow and it starts to increase in its tempo. So why did I have you attempt this this week? Well, it wasn't just because I wanted to see you squirm, although that may have been a, you know, a benefit or something that did happen, a result. This is something that happens, or I, rather, as a teacher, would like you to do every week. Okay, and not just because it happens in polkas. I want you to do this with every song that I give you. Maybe not changing in the middle of the song, but I play the song for you week to week. And I usually, matter of factly, tell you the tempo that I play the song at. Not because I expect you to be there, it's just this is where I played it. Okay? I don't expect you to go home that day that you get the music from me or you print it out and put it at the speed that I played it at and find out what happens. That is always a recipe for failure. My suggestion is to start it out maybe 20, 30 beats lower than what I played it at. And then steadily try to work up to where I am. And if you get there, try to exceed it. One of the great things about doing this is once you start to get to a higher rate and you go back down, that lower speed makes the song sound a lot simpler. It's a lot easier to play. You have a bunch more time that you didn't realize you had before to get through the song. Whereas if you just put it at that low rate and never moved it, you wouldn't have that same feeling. Or if you put it at a higher rate and never brought it down, you wouldn't have that opportunity to see progress. You'd be stumbling right from the get-go there. So my goal for you with a Celerando, we, we had it physically, tangibly printed in the music this week. My goal for you is to think about playing music every week that way. Start out slowly, gradually increase your tempo as you become more comfortable with the song. Gave you another copy of Village Tavern Polka, which was printed a bit more traditionally that week. And one of the really tricky things about that was the different patterns that the left and the right hand were creating. The right hand was playing the same note four times in one measure. The left hand was only playing it one time in the measure, and then it switched to another note while the right hand still played the same note. That's commonplace, playing traditionally. If someone's playing on a piano or they're playing traditionally on an organ, their left and their right hand are playing at two completely different rates. And I don't want to make it sound like it's easy. It's not easy, but it's just a matter of fact. That's just how playing that way, that's what you encounter. Okay, But that is one of the tricky things about the Village Tavern Polka played in that other manner, is you have to take into account the fact that your hands are oftentimes moving at completely different rates of speed, playing different notes. Our next song was a song called The Blue Tail Fly. Blue Tail Fly was tricky because three quarters of the song you probably didn't know. Or I'll say historically, um, the week that uh, we went over this with our groups here, many students were not familiar with this piece, at least the first three quarters of it. They knew the whole, oh, Jimmy Crack Corner, I don't care. Well, I, I know that one, I know that part. That's not until the end of each page. 
the song's much trickier to play when you don't know it. It's one of the reasons I love giving out songs that aren't very recognizable, because it forces you to read the notes, it forces you to take into account what the timing is. So it really lets me know as your teacher, are you following this because you're aware of the timing, or are you following it because you're able to kind of fake it because you know how the song goes? Those are a lot more fun to play sometimes, particularly because you know the song. You know if you make a mistake. But from a teacher's perspective, I want you to be able to play something you've never heard before. Okay, just like you can pick up the newspaper every morning and read an article that you've never read before and you can understand it because you know how to read. Same benefit with a song that you've never heard. We spoke about making changes in that song and how it's so advantageous to make a change during a rest. But unfortunately, that's not always a possibility. We made a change at the top of the second page of Blue Tail Fly where there was not a rest. My suggestion to you was to prepare for that. If you're playing on an instrument like an easy three or an easy two or a clavinova for that matter, and on the clavinova, maybe you don't want to use memorize because that is an option. You can set specific sounds onto buttons like guitar. You have a button that says guitars. There are a bunch of guitars on that button. So if you do a little bit of due diligence and you choose the guitar sound that you want and you say, when I get to page two, I want this guitar sound, you leave it on that button. You go back and you start with whatever you're gonna use knowing that when you hit guitar, the one you chose of all of the ones that are there listed is the one that comes up first. Okay, you only have to hit hopefully one button. It's unlike the keyboards where you gotta dial numbers in in a three, four digit combination sometimes. This is one button. Just do a little, due, uh, do, a little excuse me, due diligence before you start. Well, the only thing better than one button is no buttons. Some of you can go up or lower keyboard that starts on the easy four uh, in the Lowry's. Easy 10 follows, Fanfare, Journey, Inspire, Rialto. Uh, older models as well, things like the Premiere, things like the Holiday Classic, have upper lower keyboards. You put one sound on one level, you put one sound on the other, you just move. Great benefit to that. Some of you have the ability to save things or memorize to buttons. Again, you hit one button, you've done all the work beforehand. It allows you hopefully to slow down for as short of an amount of time as possible. The more traditionally printed copy of that one I feel like it wasn't entirely appreciated until you got the more traditional copy of Yankee Doodle. At least that's what I heard from students. Because Blue Tail Fly is very predictable in its traditional version. It's based on one chord on three throughout the whole song. Bass chord, bass chord, and they were all uh, related. A C bass, C chord, G bass, G chord, D bass, D chord, they were all the same, okay? That is quite a benefit. It doesn't mean it's easy, but there's quite a benefit to being able to predict what the left hand is going to do because that did not happen with Yankee Doodle. Yankee Doodle, first off, medley. We went over the things that medleys have to have in common. There has to be at least some commonality between the songs that you've chosen to put in your medley or your compilation. They can be written by the same person. They can have the same subject matter. They can be from the same album, the same movie, the same Broadway show. Uh, for us, we want to maintain a consistent tempo. We want to maintain a consistent time signature. It'd be great if we can maintain a consistent key that the song is in. Even if we can transpose, it still means that we're playing different keys, even if we make them sound the same. We used one sound throughout the song. We used sound bells. We did start with the flute and the bells, and then we changed to the organ and the bells. We used the duet at some points. We used the trio or the AOC on the second pages of each song. So this would be page 2A at the top and page 4A at the top. The other copy though, very tricky. Because that familiarity, that predictable, the predictability that we had in the left hand of Blue Tail Fly in the traditional sense, that went out the window with Yankee Doodle and Yankee Doodle Boy. Right off the bat with Yankee Doodle, you have C in the bass and then a G chord. And that happens throughout the song finally starts to fall into a little bit of a pattern which was familiar to Blue Tail Fly, but then you played four chords in a row before you switched over to your Yankee Doodle Boy, page 3B. And this one was entirely different. This one had instances where you played a D in the bass and then an A chord or an A7. Then there was a D minor chord on beat one and there's a chord on one. We haven't seen that very often. You get to the second page, there are instances where you're incessantly playing a chord on every beat. 
It's one of the reasons why, even in a song where you've taken away the beats, we've taken away the march, we've taken away the Broadway, we can still make it sound like two different pieces, like a medley is designed to do. I mean, it's, I know it's one cohesive piece, but there's a movement, there's a change in it. You make the change by the left hand in a traditional printed song. There's no beat, so the only way that you can make the change is via that left hand. Okay, again, very thumbnail sketch based way to, um, to review the music. Feel free, as I said, to go through every one of the hours because each one of these songs is covered in a whole hour. And that's going to do a far better job than I just did in reviewing this, but I'm hoping that I chose for you the most common elements that each song entailed so that you could use one video to get as much of a review as possible. When we come back in our next video, we're gonna start our new series. All new material, I'm really excited to go over it with you. I hope you're excited too. We'll see you very soon.